Uh, yeah, it was a, a great start to the tournament for us. Um, things that we definitely want to fine tune going into Nigeria, but um, we switched our focus really quickly and we've had a great week of training. The energy's been really high and the quality's been great, so we're just really looking forward to tomorrow. And for Tony, how have been how have the preparations been ahead of the second match of the tournament for the team? I agree with Steph. Last couple of days training has been uh, very high energy and a bust in the group. You can see the excitement. It took some days to recover from the Ireland game, both physically and mentally. Um, but after that, the last couple of days has been a very high excitement and the team feels really ready for tomorrow. Thank you very much. And now we'll take questions from the floor. Please raise your hand, state your name, media organization. Uh, we have a question at the back. Sorry. Hi, Tony. Laura Spurway from Channel 7. High energy training and a couple of concussions. It's a real shame for the team and, and for the fans. Can you just take us through what's happened there and how you're dealing with um, some more injuries? Uh, first and foremost, I have the biggest respect to our Troop SM team, our medical team, that uh, always look at player safety first. And when it's concussion protocol as a coach, you have to have the biggest respect to player's health. And if a player is ruled out, they're ruled out. Uh, when it comes to the training, I, I totally understand. If, if you didn't see the training, if I were you sitting out there, I would go like, what the heck is happening in trainings? You know, two concussions in one training, two days out of the game. But it was a complete normal training. Two days out, you always have a high-intensity, medium-sized game. We played 8v8, high-intensity, everything was good. We were unlucky, um, unfortunately, two head knocks. We want, don't want to go into details because we don't reveal those things that happens in training. But pure unluck. We didn't do anything different than normal, and, and we were a bit unlucky this time. Uh, but the session, per se, was very good. And once again, the players showed... When that happened, the medical team took care of the players and the players took care of the game and they just kept going and focused and a new player stepped in in that role and there was just, you know, like this, they're on a mission. The players are on a mission and focus on what they can control. So credit to the players uh, in yesterday's training, how they responded to it. Tracy Holmes, ABC. Um, and I know you said we get one or two questions out of the way, so I might as well get this question out of the way. Um, about Sam Kerr, uh, I understand respect for the captain and the player, but what about also respect for the Australian people uh, who support this team and will support this team no matter what, uh, just to get some sort of clarity because it's all been particularly vague and when things are vague or grey, then rumours start to take hold. So is there any clarity at all we can have on if she's going to come back in this tournament or if she is not. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the question. I think you're right. We want to show the tremendous amount of respect to our fans out there because they've been massive in terms of supporting us and we want to be in this together. Uh, but I also know that the fans want the best for the team uh, and the best for the team is to focus on the game tomorrow with the players that are available. Uh, and we've been as open as we can be to say it's a calf injury that's going to be reassessed after the Nigeria game. Uh, I, me personally don't know more than that as of now. I just focus on the players that I have available for tomorrow and I know that's how Sam wants it as well and I'm sure that the majority of the fans out there want us to focus on the players that are available to play the game and then we have an evaluation of Sam between the Nigeria and the Canada game and most likely, just a heads up now in advance, that most likely we won't be able to give you an answer on that until the day before the game because we want to wait until the last minute to see where she's at in terms of availability. Uh, Matthew Plachek, Fox Sports USA. Steph, obviously there's a lot of talent on this roster, players able to step in when needed, but from a personal level, you've grown up with these women, you've known them for a long time. How does it feel when you see Sam, Mary, and Ivy go down with injuries after the tournament starts? Yeah, obviously that's not what you want ever in a tournament, and in particular this tournament has been very exciting and um, a big moment for, for all of us as Australian players, probably the biggest moment of our careers. Um, so it's the last thing that you want to see your teammates and your friends going through. But in saying that, it's football and it happens to every single footballer on the entire planet. We're not the first team that's had injuries in major tournaments and we won't be the last. Um, so it's just how we gather. It's how the rest of the squad bounces back and performs in you know, a high-pressure situation in the biggest games. And 
I think that's... Uh, Jane Francis, uh, TVC News Niger. So my question for you, Coach, is um, can you tell us about the, the strength of the Nigerian team or how well you know them? You can leave out the weakness for how you, <laughs> how you <laughs> intend to play, but yeah, tell us the strength or what you think about the Nigerian team. And for Steph, so uh, everyone have talked about the support that the Australian fans have given to the team. And um, so how much of uh, a burden has that you know, somehow become for the team or is it just all good news all through that everyone is supporting you, uh, hosting and playing so well in this tournament so far? Me first? Um, yeah, that's a, it's a great question because it sums it up really, really well. Obviously, there's so much pressure coming into a moment like this for our team. Um, I think all of the girls have handled it incredibly well. Um, it's the most, probably the most pressure I've felt as... A, an athlete in my career coming into this tournament I think because we care so much that that builds pressure and obviously the public cares so much as well but um, when we were out there the support was insane and it definitely helped us in those final 15 to 20 minutes where things got a little bit iffy and we were under the pump um, yeah the crowd being so loud and they were with us in all those set pieces and we could feel the energy and you just don't feel tired in those moments like you normally would. You just have this extra step um, in you. And I think, you know, that's the massive advantage of playing on home soil. And we're so grateful for the support. Um, and as much as it, it did add pressure, I think it's just going to help us from here on in. Nigeria definitely have a lot of strength, more so than weaknesses. Uh, we've been targeting the, the Canada game and looked at what they did there and they, they showed against the Olympic champions that they can compete with anyone. They're one of the fastest team in the tournament uh, on the break and the transition. They have speed both on the left and the right side. They have a number nine position that can both post up and, and uh, hit runs in behind. They have central midfielders that can turn on a dime that's very technical. They have attacking outside back that doesn't hesitate to go forward. Um, I'm also impressed with a short leading and a short preparation time, how they got the team together to play for each other, tactically solid as a unit, but also uh, with individual flair and skill set. So we know we need to have an A game defensively uh, to stop their attacking threats, um, but also we know we need to move the ball really, really fast because they showed against Canada that they can play very physical if they get close into duel, and they're very, very good at that one-on-one -on -one duel game. So we need to play very fast on the ball as well. Tony, Kieran Pender from The Guardian. Uh, the team will be missing three forwards tomorrow. W where are the goals going to come from? And do you regret picking a player who, you know, you, you admitted at the beginning wouldn't be a fit until later in the tournament, given the injury crisis now? Was that a mistake? I answered that part first with Kaya. Uh, I'm never going to regret picking Kaya. Uh, I picked her for different reasons. This one was we knew she was going to have limited minutes, but her game changer quality was what we picked her for and what she showed in training last couple of weeks before selection was amazing. Uh, and then we knew it was a risk, but you never know what it's going to be like. The other thing is what she contributed to the group in the locker room and, and off the pitch with her experience and her personality, but also coming in in uh, big pressure moments uh, like a for example, extra time or PK shootout where she's come up big in big games before. Never going to regret that. She still contributes to us. Uh, in terms of the situation we have, sometimes you're unlucky and you need to deal with the cards you're handed. Um, and we're ready to play those cards. We have a lot of attacking options still uh, in the roster. But this team have also shown that we're very adaptable. So we might have a different profile of a player, but we're still going to have the same identity. We might have a different formation. We're still going to have the same identity. We've seen that time over time, last two, three games where we played almost four to five different formations and 16 different players against France, but we still have the same identity. And I think Steph said it brilliantly here a couple of minutes ago that whoever is out, whoever is out they were going to back him and we know they have quality to, to play our A game. Uh, Claudia Farhart from SVS. Steph, you're stepping up as captain in Sam's absence. Uh, how are you planning to keep morale high given the bad luck the squad's had with those injuries over the past week? 
Yeah, I mean, morale is high. There's not too much I need to do, to be honest. I think, you know, everyone's very focused. Everyone knows we need to keep the morale high. Everyone's finding energy from different sources. Um, and like I said before, injuries are a part of football. It's something we're very, very used to and something that as a player, when you're playing at the highest level, you, you become adaptable and you do get used to it and you learn how to deal with it and move past it and still get the best out of yourself. So we're there for the girls and they're there for us and they're giving us energy as well as us giving it back to them. So, um, yeah, we're just a unit and we're working together to find, you know, the best solutions to, to every situation. Hi, Steph. Uh, Teo Pelizzeri representing Keep Up Australia. Back at the start of your career, when you were playing for Melbourne Victory, you would often play and lose to the Brisbane Roar <laughs> and Tamika Butt, now Tamika Yallop, would often be scoring the goals. How would you describe the evolution of Tamika Yallop as a player from a forward to the position she takes up now to perhaps the position she may need to take up in the future? Yeah, Meeks, uh, she's an incredible player, always has been from those memories and those heartbreaks back in my Melbourne Victory days. Um, she's, yeah, so important for us and at every major tournament I think she's had such an important key role to play and it's often not maybe in her best position or the position she's used to. She's so adaptable and she's very, very selfless. She'll do whatever it is for the team and I think, to be honest, most of our, if not every single player in our squad is selfless and will do anything for the team but she really epitomises that and does it so, so well. Um, you know, she was playing wing back at times, uh, you know, during the Olympics or whatever it was and, and she just adapts to the role perfectly and puts everything she has into it and yeah, she's an incredible player, an incredible leader for us and, and so, so important. Thank you. My name is Asaswa Bayoana and I'm writing for The Guardian at this tournament. Coach, um, I'm just wondering whether you watched the Philippines-New Zealand game and what you made of it. And being that they're co-hosts, just like you are, uh, do you, does that tell you how things could end up if things don't go well? <laughs> oh, should I allow myself to think that way today? <laughs> it's a good, good question. Uh, I didn't watch much of it because I had a lot of preparation work for this training today uh, with a lot of moving pieces that I need to work through with the coaches. I watched bits and pieces of it and watched the highlights afterwards. What I can say is I think that game together with a lot of other games in the beginning of this tournament have shown that anything can happen in any game, that all the teams that are here are here to compete. There's been a lot of tight games, a lot of good games, and that was a very, very exciting and tight game as well. Um, and I think it had proven that the quality uh, of the teams that are here has risen and the start of the tournament has been amazing in terms of quality and I think it's just going to get better and better throughout the tournament. Um, Tarek Panja from the New York Times. I wasn't going to ask a question, but you've kind of alighted on something I've been thinking about. Are you surprised by, what, by that, though, coming into the tournament, eight new teams, FIFA expansion... Some people were saying, you know, like in, in France, we had Thailand losing 14 nothing to the US, but we haven't seen anything quite like that here. And you had Haiti almost being England and Philippines, Jamaica drawing with France. Is that surprising or what, how, how, do we, how do we sort of answer this? I'm glad that you bring it up because I think it's amazing where the women's game is going and the investment in the program all over the world and, and how you can see that this country with investment and, and the quality that they can bring, I think it's amazing. From a personal level, I'm not that surprised. I actually said to some of you in the weeks leading up to this in an interview that I said every team that is here is here to compete and we're not going to see the same big numbers. I was clear on that before the tournament starts. So on a personal level, I'm not surprised because I've seen the quality and the investment in the programs. But I think it's, it's a massive growth and very, very good for the tournament for women's football moving forward. Yeah, no. right, Tom. Um, Steph, you put up a, quite an emotional post about your dad, um, the anniversary of, of his passing. How proud do you think he'd be seeing you sitting now as captain of this team on the uh, advance of this big game? Yeah, um, the timing of it is um, quite unique. Going through a moment like this, it's obviously massive for family as well. So it does make you think about, you know, people that have passed. And um, yeah, I had a lot of messages today from family and friends saying that he'd be very proud. And um, yeah, he would absolutely love to see what I'm doing now and um, what our team is doing. And he'd be, um, yeah, cheering very loudly and watching on definitely. 
Tony and Jess Stewart from ABC. Um, I know the team's no doubt very method-driven, as you said. It's taking one game at a time. But given the depth challenges that you're currently going through with the outs and the injuries, the opportunity to lock in your place in the round of 16 tomorrow night with a victory over Nigeria, has that something that is that something that's been spoken about to the team? And, and I know they mentioned even the other day in a press conference that it might change the way you think about approaching Monday with the importance of getting the three points tomorrow night and a result on that. Has it something that you've, you've spoken to the players about? No, we haven't brought it up in that sense as a topic to talk about it together, but I know these players as well, how experienced they are and how mentally strong they are. Um, Steph and, and company really know what this, this means and they, they do the math. But I also think they know how to approach a good performance, meaning just yes, take one moment at a time, stick to the game plan, trust the game plan, trust each other, trust the players out there, and then follow that. And then hopefully a result is a result, meaning that's something that is post the performance. So focus on performance first and then the result take care of itself. So right now all we talk about is how can we maximize our performance tomorrow. That's all we've been talking about. Hi guys, Amy Chapman from Optus here. Um, Tony, I grilled you already this morning, so I've got two for you, Steph. <laughs> Great. Um, firstly, we'd just love to hear about what you were thinking when you stepped up for that penalty and was it the most important goal that you've ever scored and how you composed yourself in that moment? And secondly, I'd love to hear from you. We know you're a big AFL St Kilda fan. How impressed have you been with the crowds across Australia and New Zealand? There was, you know, uh, 44,000 here for... Uh, the England game. How impressed have you been with uh, the, the crowds showing up for football as a code and how far it's come, um, you know, watching this tournament? Uh, yep. Uh, so with the penalty, um, definitely the most important goal I've scored. I haven't scored many, so that's an easy one to answer. Um, yeah, to be honest, not much was going through my head. I tried to just really calm myself down, think about where I wanted to place it. I really tried to think about it as if it was just a set piece. I take a lot of corners, a lot of free kicks, so I kind of just went through the same process and picked my spot and hit it where I hoped to hit it. Um, so, yeah, that was a definitely the most important goal I think I've scored. Um, and on the crowds, I think it's been amazing to see. I think I did have a little bit of worry coming into the tournament that you know our crowds were going to be great but I wasn't really sure how the other games would go um, and straight away I think there was a Melbourne game that was on a weekday uh, middle of the day and it was like t over 20,000 I think were there watching at Amy Park and I mean that just summed it up and it's been pretty consistent since massive crowds at just about every single game um, yeah it's been incredible to watch and I think it just shows how far women's football has come and um, this is just the start, really. Tony, you mentioned uh, investment earlier, so I thought I'd ask you and Steph this question. Um, the Indigenous Football Association sent a letter to uh, FIFA uh, outlining what they called an egregious omission of funding specific to Indigenous football from the legacy project, from the... 2023 World Cup. Do you think that's a, a glaring omission from footballers Australia, Football Australia's behalf, considering all the acknowledgement that First Nations people are getting during the tournament elsewhere? Uh, Apologise my Swinglish now, but some of those words were a bit difficult for me. What, what, what do you really mean with the question? I'm so sorry. I don't want to sound disrespectful. The, le the legacy uh, program from this World Cup doesn't specifically allocate any funding to Indigenous football programs led by Indigenous people. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, difficult to comment when I'm not educated uh, on that matter. What I can say is uh, I am really passionate about investment in grassroots and all the communities, and the more people we can get into the game, the, the better it is. Uh, it's difficult for me to comment more on that when I'm not educated on, on the question, but I, I'm definitely passionate about investment in the grassroots, including that part, so but it's, it's very difficult for me when I'm not educated in the question. Um, same, like Tony said, um, I'm not educated as much in that topic, but obviously I think it's an important part of grassroots football and absolutely should be a focal point. And if you know there's funding, it should absolutely be given in that direction. It's something that our team's very, very passionate about. Um, so yes, definitely.
Um, one for Tony, Emma Kemp from the City Morning Herald. Um, I was just hoping you might be able to provide a little bit more context around what happened with both Mary and Ivy. Um, the Football Australia release said it was two separate incidents. So, like, yeah. what what was happening when each of them went down? And also, just in terms of like markers or symptoms, did they did they have any, and are they fully recovered now? Um, I wish I could hand over the question to a doctor sitting next to me here because I want to really respect uh, the integrity of a player and the medical experts here. But uh, yes, they had uh, concussion symptoms and that's why they were ruled out. Both of them were out there on the pitch today. Um, Mary even did some, some jogging. Uh, but in terms of the step-by-step the -step in the concussion protocol, I, I'll leave that to the, to the medical experts to, to deal with. In terms of the separate incidents, uh, just to keep it standardized like we've always done, we don't go into details what happens in training, but there was no physical contact and no teammates that you know was behind it. It was just pure unlock uh, what happened during a game. Um, and two separate incidents, a bit unreal to be honest. I never experienced anything like it. Uh, if it's a collision, maybe you, you and me head to head and there's two, two concussions, but this is two separate incidents in the same training. It's a bit unreal, really. But I don't want to go into details on exactly what happened just to keep the standards in, in what we normally do regarding training, meaning we keep it internally. Um, Anna Harrington from AAP. Um, Tony, just to follow up on sort of injuries, one, just the availability of Tamika, um, Claire Polkinghorne and Alana Kennedy, and also just with uh, Mary and Ivy, given the approach you guys took with Sam, was there ever a temptation to try and keep it under wraps like what you did um, a, a week ago uh, rather than announcing it today? <laughs> no, because we knew straight after after going into training today, we knew, we were informed already, it was 100% certain. The medical team had a meeting with us last night and said, this is what it is. And when we know that going into training, we're going to have media training today in open session. Why hide anything at that point? Uh, when I sat here in the press conference going into Ireland game, uh, I personally knew that Sam most likely wouldn't play, but we had a meeting at 9.30 at night after that press conference when they informed after the scan where Sam was. And then we felt that night before the game, okay, we keep it to the team sheet. Um, not lying, but not telling it in advance either, if that makes sense. So it felt natural to just tell, tell us that it's this morning because everyone was going to know it anyway. And the second one was... Ah, yes. Uh, all available. Uh, Meeks still with some limited minutes. Uh, coming back from that um, knock that she got in that France game, she still has some limited minutes. And because she's coming back from that foot surgery as well and haven't played consistently, there's some limited minutes on her, but all are available. We have time for two more questions. One in the back. Klaus Andersson, we play Sweden. I'm sorry, I'm going to hit Tony with a question in Swedish here. Tony, det blir två frågor. Först, hur hanterar du, hur mycket ställer det till att du har skador nu på de tre anfallarna, Kör, Fowler och även Simon? Och andra frågan blir, hur hanterar du förväntningarna som är? Vi ser här inne, det är knökat, det var 75 000 på förra matchen. Och med all respekt, och tre spelare i Vittsjö, det är en viss skillnad att spela på Vittsjö IP mot fullsatta läktare och miljoner på framför tvn. Yeah. Can you answer that one, Steph? Yeah, we don't have <laughs> translation. We don't have translation in come Swedish. In. <laughs> come in. <laughs> that means come on in Swedish. Good job, Steph. Um, no, but we start with the first one in terms of the, um, the support we have. No, uh, we don't have translation. Sorry. Oh, you want me to answer in English? Oof. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We can. Question in English. Ah. <laughs> can you take it in English, please? <laughs> uh, the first question was, uh, once again, uh, how are you going to adapt to the uh, missing out on uh, uh, free strikers when you normally play with two? And the second one is uh, how you handle all expectations. Uh, some of the girls play in uh, a team called Vic in, in Sweden, and it's a really, really, really small stadium uh, they play in, and it's a bit of big more expectations and, and crowd here. Yeah. I'll answer it twice, but I do it quick. So I go Swedish first, and then I translate for you, I promise. Now, when it comes to support that we know, so we see it not as press. We see it really as that we have support. We felt it really against Ireland. Steph said this earlier in the press conference, that the last 15 when we were pressed and many set plays against us, so we pushed them forward. We felt an incredible support. Det andra med att ha en hel del forvarsskadare gör att vi har lite begränsat med alternativ men vi har tillräckligt med alternativ för att spela likadant som vi vill. 
den som kommer in och tar platsen kommer att göra ett lika gott jobb men har en annorlunda profil som spelare. Och det andra är att vi kan också göra en formationsförändring. Vi har spelat 3-4-3 också så vi har båda alternativen. Så so in English. Um, I said um, about the, the pressure. We don't look at it as pressure. We look at it as support. Steph said it the last 50 minutes against Ireland when the st stadium carried us through that period of the game. We feel we feel really supported. And the second one was with a lot of attacking options not available. We still have enough attacking option to play the same way. But we also shown that we have the ability to adapt, whether that's changing formation or changing personnel. Just the last one now at the back. Hello, uh, Hugo Moussonnier, Radio France Internationale. Uh, question for you, uh, Steph. You're going to play in Brisbane. Obviously, it's uh, no ordinary venue because it will be the host uh, city of the Olympic Games uh, in less than uh, 10 years. Uh, the Olympic Games, it's also a great event for women uh, football. How do you feel about playing uh, here, your second game in this World Cup? Yeah. Um I've played a fair few games here in Brisbane and absolutely love it. This is our base as well, so it does feel a bit like home. So it's um, yeah, an exciting opportunity and Brisbane have been incredible hosts to us and um, you know, so many people just walking around are absolutely loving the World Cup and um, yeah, seeing the fan festival, uh, how many people are just flocking down to that every single day um, and then obviously hosting an Olympics Uh, coming up is also incredible and it shows how well Brisbane do to host major tournaments like this and major sporting events. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to play here.